All right, I believe everybody is here. Um, we'll be maybe joined by one other uh, guest today, but um, I think this is the full lineup right now. We'll take it away, guys. Cool. Um, well, firstly, I just want to sort of thank Ruben and Yena Char again, kind of agreeing to co-host the Privacy Roundtable with us. It's a great little series. Um, today, we've got a very special guest, the BMCTO. I know you sort of gave your name last time, and I'm, I'm really, I'm just really bad at remembering names. But, you know, if, if you sort of want to happily reintroduce yourself before we get to that bit, um, the topic of today is certainly something that I'm really passionate about subject wise, which is, you know, using distributed ledger technology and, and crypto technology to essentially improve voting and governance structures, which is a huge topic. And I think everyone in this room probably has something relevant to say or an area of relevant experience. I particularly am thinking of, of, of Ruben and um, uh, 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 and Diana Char respectively for their projects here because I'm aware of the stuff they've done and certainly with regards to us. Um, but yeah, I'll introduce myself first of all. My name is Dr. Kapil Amarasinga. I am um, a strategic advisor to the Particle Project and Basic Swap Dex. Um, so that's a privacy ecosystem. I would say it's Basic Swap Dex is right now probably the world's most private, anonymous, and secure Dex. Certainly, the only Dex in the world that currently permits bidirectional atomic swaps for Monero. And we will soon be incorporating Litecoin with Mimble, well, Mimble Wimble support uh, via our Litecoin pairings as well. So that that that's to look forward to. And if you want to buy and sell goods online, commission free, without any KYC or any sort of middlemen trying to exploit you. Particle Marketplace, particle.io, P-A-R-T-I-C-L.io. Anyway, over to my next co-host, Ruben. Hey, yeah, uh, so I'm Ruben, the project steward of Firo. We've been around since 2016. We are behind some of the, I guess, the most important privacy protocols. Um, we came up with, uh, well, we, we were the first to implement ZeroCoin, then Sigma, uh, and then Lelantis and Avarian, which is also used in Beam, called Lelantis Mimba Wimba. And currently we're on Lelantis Spark. Uh, we are building a privacy ecosystem called Spark Assets, uh, which allows you to create arbitrary assets uh, that are indistinguishable from each other. I guess very similar to Beam's confidential assets with a, a different technology base. And yeah, we also actually had uh, i guess some experience in uh voting in 2018 we helped the thai democrat party run its uh elections in 2018 and it was a nationwide with over 127,000 votes cast and we've actually also come up with a entirely new voting uh system that can be used for DAOs as well so yep i'll pass it on to yan cha Sure. Yeah, I'm I'm Yenichar. I'm um, part of the Pivx community. Pivx is a private cryptocurrency proof of stake, and um, I, I think it's really nice. It's a great topic today on um, governance. Governance was actually one of the things that initially attracted me to the Pivx community. They were years ago. They were very interested in governance, and um, I had recently read a book on. Um, organizing loosely coupled people. It was uh, written by Rick um, Falkving. Hopefully I'm getting that name right. Uh, he um, He's the founder of the Swedish Pirate Party, and he wrote a great book, Swarmwise, on how to organize people in, in loosely coupled organizations. And um, PIVX was actually a place where I, I found people who'd also read the book and could discuss it and theorize on. So uh, I'm, yeah, I'm really looking forward to today's topic. Yeah, and that's back to you, Dr. Cap. Oh, and the Beam CTO, would you like to just introduce yourself as well? Uh, yeah, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me uh, here again. And uh, my name is Alex. I'm the CTO of Beam. Uh, and uh, definitely a very uh, important and uh, relevant topic uh, for everyone and for Beam especially now as we're working on our DAO transition. So, yeah, a, lo a lot of thoughts and ideas. We'll be happy to discuss. Oh, that's excellent. Um, so, 
kind of like I mentioned at the very beginning, there are a million different directions I feel we could go in with this. Yes. It's a huge topic, decentralized governance. Um, I think where I want to start with it, because I see the potential for this being a multi-episode event or a saga. Well, I actually see it right. being, you know, potentially an entire series in its own right, you know. Uh, and I, I do ultimately believe privacy should be the key to any sort of functional decentralized governance system. I know for a fact that's how the oral voting system that Vero used worked because, you know, it's, it was done quite elegantly. Um, but the one I, where I want to start is actually is with PivX because um, you kind of responded or made a really interesting tweet about how PivX as a project had lost its core development team three on three different occasions. Now, just for reference, Particle, <laughs> Fero, and PivX all have on-chain governance systems. We all, I don't know if Fero has but the Fero decentralized doesn't. treasury. No, Fero doesn't, my apologies. But I know PivX and, um, and, and Particle has on-chain uh, decentralized governance. And we both utilize decentralized treasuries. And I know that right. you, you made a comment that PivX had sort of lost its core devs on two or three occasions but because you had this kind of governance and funding structure in place built in via the setup of your chain that you were essentially able to hire developers and keep the project going right uh, and i was hoping you could maybe start by talking about that because i feel that's really relevant to the current state of play for how cryptocurrency projects have historically and at present do continue to utilize on-chain governance I was hoping you could kind of elaborate. Right, yeah, sure. And uh, right, that was a thread. I think it was it was uh, someone else who brought up the fact that developers had left, but it was true. It was certainly a true statement. And, uh, and uh, right, it's a great point about the robustness of, um, of the system that PIVX has or, or you know, a, a system with multiple, um, like, power centers, if you will. And, and I think that's a, it's a really important way to look at governance of any organization, I mean, e even um, traditional corporations and partnerships and so forth, is there's always multiple power centers involved in the organization. It's, it's, there's like a formal one, and then there's many informal ones, or like gray eminences, as you might call it. And I, I think in cryptocurrency, you know, like like you mentioned, Dr. Cap, you know, Particle and, and PIVX, they have a formal, like a voting um, and treasury mechanism, and I, I really like the one in, in PIVX, eager to hear more about the one in Particle. And uh, it, it, it's a great system, you know, that, that you, you vote, masternodes vote, and, uh, and uh, they vote on proposals where, where people, um, you know, have first discussed in a forum what they'd like to do and kind of, you know, build some consensus. And uh, then they put out a formal proposal that they pay 50 PIV to put out you know, which is um, which is a few few U.S. dollars equivalent, and um, and then masternodes vote on them, and they put out a payment address, and masternodes vote, and it's just automatic based on the voting. There's a threshold that you have to reach. You know, it's like 10 percent of of yes votes minus no votes um, uh, uh, as a percentage of the total number of masternodes. There's like a threshold out there you have to pass, and then if everybody's met the threshold. Then they're ranked and um, and paid by ranking on votes. I, I think that's a that's a great system. I like it a lot. You know, it, it's it's not perfect. Nothing ever is. Um, you know, one of the things that's that's like maybe imperfect about it is there's no way to enforce that people do the thing they're going to do. You know, they get the payment up front. So there's a reputation aspect of it that plays into that. But um, it's a great system. But I think it's important to look at it as it's not the only like power center in in PIVX, just like there's not ever any one power center in any crypto. There's also, I think other big ones are developers. You know, it's, uh, any cryptocurrency, it's, it's software centric and software organizations, the developers are a power center. You know, you might say, yeah, they're paid or whatever, but really you need those those end of people those individuals to add value to the software so they're, they're always a power center in cryptocurrency whales are always a power center i mean that's kind of what makes in, in my mind like bitcoin and monero which don't have 
these other formal mechanisms work or, or whales behind the scenes. And then, of course, the people that serve as a face to the organization are a power center. And, and there may be others, you know. So, you know, getting back to, to your, your point about, you know, yeah, so developers leave. There, there's a power center. Something, you know, went wrong. The developers leave. You need an organization where the other power centers are 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 big enough and powerful enough that they can absorb that and recover. And I think, you know, that's what has happened with PIVX. And like we're, we're, um, we're, we recovered and we have great developers today. And um, I, I, the one thing I would add to that, so it's important to have power centers that, that can compensate for others when there's a problem, but also it's important to strive for alignment as much as possible with those multiple power centers. That's when things are maximally functional. So I guess that'd be my take on that, Dr. Cap. No, no, yeah, I, I, uh, I share many of your sentiments there. Um, I certainly agree. One of those things where public faces can be power centers. I find it really funny that I'm a very public face for the particle project and basic swap decks. I don't take you are. payment. <laughs> I am. I don't take any payment. I'm not a formal employee, but because my face is so very public and because I speak so publicly, it inadvertently, and it's really scary to think of that if you cut it, if I give it more than superficial thought, but that, that is very much the case. Same applies to Wales. Kind of going back to what you were sort of asking, um, you know, power, you know, in, in terms of um, our governance structure, you know, we're a pro particle. The particle blockchain is a proof of stake cryptocurrency. Um, and so we have on chain voting and on chain governance features built into that. Now, the way that sort of works is that, you know, people can discuss things much like you said in, in our forums uh, or in or any of our chat channels. And, you know, if there's if, if someone if anyone wants to put a proposal forward, we kind of have our own sort of CCS. So it's basically a community proposals page where you can basically put up a proposal, outline it, say, you know, how much you how much you need to get it funded. And then, you know, essentially the community then votes by either, you know, either we kind of so that there's two mechanisms in place. There's kind of the on-chain voting aspect and the proposals aspect. So if you put a proposal forward, you know, that we you can either fund that or and you can basically donate to that. And if it passes, then you know, it's the obligation of the proposer mm. to kind of make it happen. And as you said, it's one thing getting the funding and one thing getting a proposal passed in paper. It's another thing making sure the person who's put it forward commits to it. Does it right. So there is a human factors element to that. You know, there's a trust element. The other aspect to our governance is, as I said, it's on-chain voting. So when everything comes to things like, you know, a really good example was our coin inflate, our coin issuance policy. So up to, I think... Gosh, it's going back now. This is such a blur, but I guess 2018, I think we were operating on maybe 2% inflation issuance. Uh, and then essentially we had a general consensus vote in order to basically set up our decentralized treasury to fund ongoing development for our team. We basically had a vote where we agreed to increase our supply inflation per annum from 2% to 8%. And 50% of that block reward would basically go to this decentralized treasury, which they then used to fund developers. And every six months, we basically have on-chain votes, whereby the stakers in the network, every time you a staker proposes a block, it effectively signals a vote. So, mm. you know, those who hold the largest numbers of tokens have the strongest amount of, if as long as they're actively sort of staking and they've set their staking so that it's engaging in a so that the blocks generated are signaling for a particular vote you know those stakers effectively have very real stake in the future of the network um we've got quorum limits i think it's 66 percent again the, the the exact numbers off the top of my head i'd have to go back and look but if you want to do like a, a real significant protocol change at core level i think you need at least i think it's about two thirds need to vote in favor of it as opposed to something that doesn't affect our protocol. And then you need a minimum quorum as well, which I believe is a third mm. as well. So you need a well, minimum that's number. That's very interesting. Of, it's it's yeah. different for, for the nature of the, of the activity. 
Is that right? Um, like if it's changing the protocol, you need a higher yeah. threshold. It, it, it Very has a much higher threshold. Mm -hmm. So we have, a, we have a general agreement that it needs a much higher participation in terms of to reach quorum, you need a higher number of blocks participate of the net across the staking of staking power participating and a much higher threshold to say, yes, we're going to get it through. So it's very much models the constitutional change versus non-constitutional right, right. nature. change. To see. change the constitution takes more than, takes a higher percentage in the same way. Exactly. Right. So I think it's interesting. I think it 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 is largely worked. One thing that um, I would say is um, just to say, one thing I would say is that um, I think what's really important is it's not just about having that structure in place, but making sure, certainly when it comes to funding developers, a really important thing is making sure your underlying system has sufficient liquidity to attract and retain developers. And that's one thing that really, you know, drew me to your discussion and that thread was the fact that you'd had this on-chain governance mechanism, which was successful, but also that you had managed to preserve sufficient network liquidity to make that a viable solution. So I kind of wanted to kind of get your thoughts on that, really. Well, um, um, yeah, go yeah. ahead. I think, well, I'm going to be the devil's advocate after this. So, because I know <laughs> Beam has, it's also a governance token called BMAX. Uh, so I guess, you know, maybe it'll be good uh, for for Beam CTO, for Alex to, to elaborate on, on his mechanism. And then I'm going to uh, highlight some things that have happened in our past that have made us very, uh, well, at least personally, I'm pr pretty against coin voting. Uh, but I'll leave that to later and let Alex uh, speak first. Yeah. Um, yeah, so... Um... When we started thinking about our DAO and the implementation and how to build it, uh, so obviously we had like two completely different governance scenarios. Like you have some things that can be automated within a smart contract and then voted on chain and then it will happen automatically as, for example, distribution of rewards of some protocol according to the voting power of the governance token holders. And uh, it's... Um, uh, let's say the simpler case of the two, because you can create a mechanism, obviously you need to test it and make sure it's reliable, but then uh, once this mechanism is in place, certain parameters, fund distribution, et cetera, can be voted upon on chain and it will work as a smart contract. The much bigger problem is, as you mentioned, with uh, things that require human facilitators, whether it's uh, deploying updates or uh, if it is, uh, for example, doing some major changes in the protocol, some things like that anything that requires human involvement. Now, uh, so for example, let's say you want to develop an upgrade to a smart contract and then you want the DAO to vote uh, on, on this upgrade. So you could theoretically develop it, test it, deploy it, and then let the DAO vote on chain for the activation. But it's a little bit problematic if the DAO votes, no, you did all of this work for nothing. So obviously you want to get some off-chain consensus before you actually engage with it. And then when the code is actually delivered and uh, is on chain, then the DAO can vote uh, on, on activating it uh, on the main. So this is kind of the middle ground for this. This covers some of the cases, but still not all of them. And that's where this problem of developers and key people in the project, face of the project, that they, they all come together because eventually there are some things that are centralized. It could be uh, some accesses. Once again, everything is possible to duplicate, but uh, it takes time, it's problematic sometimes, some servers need to be accessed or things like that. Even though it's possible to recreate them, uh, you wouldn't necessarily want to do it every time, uh, you know, just for decentralization kicks. Um, and this is something that we actually discussed very fairly recently as an idea of how to build uh, all kinds of interesting mechanisms. And by the way, this is also where privacy comes to place because you like one of the things that we were debating is how to build a system with shared secrets where some people control those secrets but in case those people disappear or are not available or not responding these secrets can be then accessed by other DAO members with some consensus or some multi-sync or like um kind of uh, idea um you don't want to these secrets to be 
visible to everyone on chain, but you want, do want to store them in a smart contract. And this is where kind of encryption or interesting ideas around that come into play. So right now in Beam, we have this uh, kind of DAO structure with uh, two types of proposals. One is more for kind of off-chain ideas, solutions, and uh, proposals that uh, require human intervention. And the other one, which is still work in progress, is for distribution of the rewards accumulated in the DAO. Um, but yeah, like a, a lot of open questions still. So, well, Alex, just to be clear, like you were mentioning, like you could come, you could like do all the work I, and compile it into, into new code, and then vote on it in the DAO. Are you thinking that the that that would be an automatic mechanism in in, in some way, or would there still be um, like people involved in making the the new release come into effect? How 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 would that that uh, that final step work? Okay, so it depends on on the implementation. For example, every smart contract in Beam, it has a parameter which is set when the contract is deployed, and this parameter is um, affecting the time it it takes between the new version of the smart contract being uploaded to the chain and when it is activated. Uh, oh. This is designed. This is designed to avoid rug pulls of somebody who has uh, been access to a smart contract, deploys a smart contract, and ah. then upgrades, upgrades it immediately and steals the funds. So when you are interacting with a smart contract on the chain, you can check what is this parameter, and then you can say, okay, at least I will have one week, two weeks, one month, whatever, depending on, on the contract, uh, to understand what was the upgrade about and to make certain steps. So it will not be immediate. Now... After that, you can also create a smart contract that says this update will be uh, conditional. Only if a certain amount of DAO voters will vote on it, only then it will be activated at this point in time and not like without the vote. So you can automate this process. I see. That's Obviously, very nice. the deployment, yeah, the deployment of the update needs to be done by the creator of the contract. But once again, this can be uh, also kind of uh, conditionally implemented with, with DAO in mind. Very nice. Yeah, so I guess my turn to, to speak. Uh, and so I, just to give some context, I was very involved in the Dash community, uh, which was, I guess, the first uh, you know, master note voting, and probably maybe one of the first on-chain voting. I'm not sure whether Decred was uh -huh. earlier. This is also here. And I know Pivax, <clears throat> basically, I, if I correct me if I'm wrong, I think basically your your governance system is uh, inherited from Dash, right? That's basically, right. Basically, one yes. master note, yes. one yes. vote, That's correct. crash holes, yep. blah blah blah, all of that, right? Yeah. And That's I right. I was a very large Dash holder at one point, and I remember. And I think first of all, when we talk about coin voting, we have to remember that. Coin voting is basically saying the more coins you have, the more votes that you have, right? It's basically saying that in a country, the richer you are, the more say you have, which is true, but not so direct, right? Like, for example, that the, what's the name of that really rich, uh, was it Bloom Bloomberg? You know, even though he was super rich, he, he still couldn't really win, right? right? But when you have coin voting... Yeah, it was you know, Bloomberg. Sorry? Yeah, it was Bloomberg. Sorry. Yeah. And then... And now we have to remember that it also depends on the emission cycle, right? A lot of our, you know, our coin cycles are based on like early large inflation and then it starts uh, being reduced early on. That means you reward early adopters. Now, if you make coin voting the way to go, it really, really benefits uh, the, the early ones, right? <clears throat> and I have seen, especially for master note voting, especially in Dash, even in Firo, uh, we never implemented master note voting, but I was thinking, wow, if we were to implement it, at one point, Dash was like, I think $100 or $200, I can't remember, which meant to own a vote of Dash, you would need to hold about 100000 US dollars. Right, it was big. Yeah, it was, mm -hmm. it's, it's huge, right? And that basically cuts off all of this. And once you have that sort of entrenchment you can never displace them right and you know decrat system i know they are one of the you know exitus is here is they are also like one of the leaders as well and you will find that they will always vote 
So in this case, in Decred's case, like the proof people, uh, you know, obviously they're the stickers, they get tickets and then tickets you, gives you votes. And that's, I may be getting exactly wrong, but that's like the, the general gist. And <clears throat> obviously they voted to reduce their hybrid system to cut rewards um, to become 1% minus 99% proof of stake, something like that. And we've also seen in Dash, whenever there was a hybrid between uh, proof of work and, and master notes, obviously when you give master notes a vote, they kept on slashing the proof of work portion continuously <laughs> because they are the, the sole determinants, right. right? Right. Yeah. And obviously people, you know, to kind of mitigate this issue, we can do the delegation thing, you know, to say, oh, maybe I may not have enough to, to have a master note, but if I can delegate my vote, you know, there's this delegated proof of stack, DPoS, and then, you know, EOS was very famous for it. And what actually happened was because you are a small fella, a small fish, you don't really care. You're just like, ah, I want to, you know, delegate my vote and get some rewards. They pay me a bribe, right? Basically to, to go into their voting pool, right? To delegate it to them. And it became basically an oligopoly. And basically these EOS people just kept voting for themselves to, to increase their, their, it becomes like a, how do I put this nicely? It just basic, basic, and all they weren't actually doing things to benefit Jack because one of the mistaken things to think is that if I have more coins, if I have more coins and the biggest stake in the project, therefore I will vote that is what is best for the project. And Firo actually had a well which had about 20% of the supply, which he had acquired. Uh, you know, through buying and also he had actually a founder's reward and he basically <clears throat> wanted to vote it as such to make master notes unaffordable for the average Joe so that he and his cronies can control the project, right? And obviously, <clears throat> because we didn't have the master note voting, I just said like, look, we let's put it to the community vote except I don't want people to be just like, oh, yes or no. I want people to state the reason, you know, like if this is an important issue, I want you to see a reason why you support this thing, which also makes it harder to stop up. I mean, yeah, maybe now with chat GPT is a bit easier, but you know, back then before chat GPT, at least you had to think a bit and you, the community <laughs> sorely rejected it. And as a result, like, you know, it kind of shows that the intentions of someone who holds a lot of coin may be to extract as much value from the project in the short term and then just like leave. They may not be aligned in the long-term interest, which right. is, I find that it is important to rework, to give a lot of Firo or coins or whatnot, but big contributors to the project. Some of the biggest contributors to our project Maybe have a little smattering of Firo, you know, maybe they can't afford it or like that's just on me and they just really like what we're doing. And I find that I rather have an active member of the community that's giving good feedback, maybe contributing code, maybe contributing good suggestions, rather than a passive silent well that's just like, hey, tell me what to do, huh? you know, like, should I vote this way or not? Which was what happened when I was in Dash, they, they were, they were, there were people in the core community that would ask me, hey, Ruben, on this proposal, vote this way. You know, the whales are voting this way. And it became like, wow, you know, this is like, like we are the elite, right? <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah, that's my two things. I could go on for a long time, but no, I feel that it's very flawed. Yeah. Well, I think those, those are excellent points, Ruben. Excellent. And I think, you know, any voting system, you know, there's like books written on voting, right? They're all going to be flawed yeah, I think in some way. And, 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 yeah. Oh, can you hear me now? Test, test. Uh, I can, but I'll just make sure to make Beam CTO a speaker again. Oh. Well, I, I wanted to add, Ruben, I, I think those are excellent points. Now, of course, and you touched on this, but I think I think it's worth it's worth emphasizing. Those those like whales and those masternode voters, they they are also incentivized since they own so much of it to have the project succeed. So if if they if they let like their short-term goals of more rewards being paid to themselves 
out, you know, outweigh in their mind the long-term benefits of having the project succeed. I mean, in a, in a way, that's also flawed reasoning, right? So there, if if um, it, it's certainly a valid point, but there is there are counterbalancing forces that make it work when the people who own the master nodes like think through it and and vote vote in a truly optimal way. I would like to think that, but I feel that's very cyclical uh, in the sense that, you know, it depends who your wells are. And, you know, as you saw in the trade, you know, uh, one or two big, like, wells that have a lot of power, they just don't like someone or whatnot, they can vote. Right. No, that's true. Of whether it's good for the project or not. And they have an outsized weight to their vote. You know, in in the way that's like, why should this guy, you know, just pop block the the entire proposal just because he's powerful, right? And and that to me is a kind of like you know, like reinforcing the, right the the the, the systems that we're trying to break through. But but I I think also we have I mean look at the model of a corporation, which I think is a fantastic model, right? And in a corporation, um, you know, there's a board of directors of uh, that 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 are like between the voters and the people who do the execution in the company. But that, and maybe that's the moderating force that's needed there because certainly a corporation succeeds and the people who own the most of, most of the corporation get the most votes, right? So it's, um, there's, there's a model there that we can look at and see that, you know, have, having more stake deserves more votes and it works, but it, you know, maybe it's that board of directors as an intervening entity, you know, at least in, you know, U.S. corporations uh, that um, that moderates that. Sure. And I think like in any sort of government, obviously, the average voter doesn't have you know all the issues on mind and therefore they delegate it to their representatives, which has its own problems. But. I guess it's the kind of like most workable in between, right? Where you are electing people to represent the project. They have a fixed term, right? And and the thing is that there is a very, very good post um, in by, by Vitalik that talks about on-chain voting. And he's also a huge critic on saying that if it's just about coin voting and it's not right, Obviously, there are also a lot of other things like futaki or like, you know, basically where you're voting and then if your outcome leads to something good, uh, then, you know, you get rewarded or something like that. And there's a lot of like quadratic voting, which is used in Gitcoin, you know, where there's some sort of matching ability and all of that, which is also really cool. Right. The issue with a lot of these voting systems is that even if they are on paper very good, one of the benefits of, I guess, coin voting is that everyone gets it. Even though it's super flawed, everyone gets it. Like, you know, one coin, one vote. You know, it's simple. You have more coins, you have more vote rather than like, oh, you need this futaki thing. You know, how am I going to explain it in a very uh, simple way or like quadratic voting, right? Or <laughs> it's, uh, it may be in theory a lot better, but then it becomes very hard to explain to the average voter, right? So there is a balance. It, 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 there's and, also a higher cognitive burden with with quadratic voting i mean it's not just picking your favorite it's allocating across across multiple uh choices and that that takes more work for the voter yeah so so let me just quickly uh first of all you know beam cdo you're there which we've re-invited you as a speaker and you know please but what what the way that i guess like you know monero and like well, Bitcoin, I would say, well, the governance is kind of messed up. But, um, like, in a way, what Monero does is kind of, like, representative, but not in a very formalized sense. And that's kind of how it works in Firo, like, where there is a, a change, right? Usually, we'll start with a proposal on the forums. And, you know, we're not going to allow, like, someone that just registered their account uh, straight away to, to vote unless, uh, you know, it's a recognized member of the community, you know, he's been hanging out in other places, just never registered a forum account. And obviously that, that requires a little bit of trust on the people that are, you know, approving who is becoming, who is allowed to vote. 
but it's also in a way semi-transparent, right? In the sense that, ah, yeah, okay, this person, although he's new, everyone ha- can see that this person has been in the community for, for, for at least a certain period of time. And what happens then is that usually we have a feedback period, you know, people weigh in and whatnot. They have to elaborate their reasons rather than just a simple yes or no poll. And if there is generally, I would say, you know, support in, in one way or another, you know, you can just see from the trade or not, then we will implement it. But if it becomes like very contentious where it's clear like things are kind of like 50-50, then yeah, we're not going to like implement it. So that means that the threshold for passing something is quite high, but it does mean it is kind of informal, which makes it also harder for outsiders to game. But the drawback is that well, you kind of have to, you know, semi-trust the, 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 the people that are holding these polls and what not to do it in a fair manner. And we try to do as much and it's kind of transparent because you can see who we are being allowed to, to speak, who, whose accounts we're upgrading. And, and yeah, you know, we are not silencing anyone. So I feel like in lack in 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 the lack of a better solution, and I'm sure there are better solutions. Like I think there could be a combination of some coin holding, forum age, and other sorts of verifications and all sorts of things that can be combined to have some sort of weight or whatnot. Uh, but yeah, you know that that needs additional work. <laughs> so, Ruben, where where does, um, where does that is the co- to where does on. the funding come from after the voting is done? Is it donations in the same way it is with Monero, like is like the CCS? How, how, so we do have a funding. We do have a community fund committee, which so so there's uh, two two funds in in the Fira. One which is just like the core development fund. We, we do what we want with it, but we, we report how we spend it, right? So that's obviously the centralized component, right? And then after that, then there is the community fund, which was newly kind of created in the past, maybe two years or so. And this is a separate fund that is uh, elected of seven, seven people that's elected from the community. None of the core team members uh, can serve on it. And... Uh, for the moment, they, they basically administer the community fund. They vote on stuff and say like, oh yeah, should we fund this or should we not fund this? And I think that's like kind of like baby steps to having like a kind of like a representative <laughs> kind of government. But obviously there is issues. Like obviously when you think about it, there, especially with regulations and privacy coins being seen as the bogeyman, you know, there will probably be a time where less and less people want to be serving on the, the community fund committee. But we have to kind of like train the community to be, uh, you know, able to take responsibility over certain things. So like these are like the training wheels, right? And eventually we want even the core team fund to be removed completely and managed by, you know, something with some sort of on-chain voting. But the exact mechanisms, I mean, we have the technology to execute it, but we just have to say, well, who is entitled to vote? You know, how much weight that, that, those are the tougher bits that are harder to solve, which we have some idea of, but we have kind of like other stuff that we are working on uh, at the moment, like spark assets uh-huh. and all. In, in, in the yeah. funds, they come. Is there a formal mechanism by which they come? They're created, or, or do they come from donations? The the, the, the so, sorry the origin one? of those funds. The co- ah, the the community fund committee is funded directly from the block. Got it. Work. Got it. Uh, mm-hmm. We 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 do have a donations, which is coming in really helpful and that's actually managed by a completely independent board called the magic board which also uh manages certain funds for monero and the benefit of the magic fund is that there's a committee you know we have to make sure that it's scientific research based and all of that but the benefit of having that magic committee is that donations in if you're a u.s citizen is com- it's like becomes tax-free or something like that so we got like a few hundred thousand dollars pure donation it's been very very helpful uh and yeah it is really nice to have that because they don't even ask for any coins or whatever it's just a pure donation uh, writing off i guess tax expenses so that's cool <laughs> right um i i, I have uh, a question so, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. 
Yes, yes, sorry, yes. I had some issues. So, uh, kind of expanding on the previous point that Ruben made, like, uh, how do you feel about uh, like votes being uh, anonymous or not? I mean, uh, is it something that's beneficial to have anonymous voting, or uh, all of them, or maybe some of them? Because uh, as Ruben said, if you are uh, participating in the DAO for a privacy coin, you may not want everyone to know about it. So uh, in this case, you could just vote anonymously. Right. It's great. So question. I do think that certain things need to be transparent uh, and some things need to be private. But it depends on the type of vote, right? When it comes to when it comes to actually like, you know, deciding on the future of the project, the direction of certain things, I think it's helpful for people to see who is that vote coming from, right? In the sense that, ah, okay, you know, this is a prominent member of the community, you know, therefore like his vote is kind of like a signaler, right? Uh, but at the same time, the other problem is that maybe what should also be hidden is something called ballot progress, right? You, w when the vote is going on, people should not know which way is winning. <laughs> and that's a lot of problems with the, a lot of on-chain voting systems where, you know, a lot of times like, ah, you know, if, if I see 90% is voted yes, you know, there's very little chance of, oh, why should I spend a guess to vote no, right? But if the, that ballot progress is hidden, then even though there may be like a lot, it doesn't discourage people from voting no because they don't know, well, you know, maybe my vote makes sense, maybe my vote doesn't make sense. Obviously, when they are, you know, when it's things to do about sentiment check and whatnot, yeah, sure, maybe pure anonymous voting, which Aura is supposed to be designed where you can verify that it's a valid voter, but not which way a person a voter like real elections right you you need to have that kind of anonymous voting but in those cases yeah you know you don't want to be singled out you don't want to be like punished for your vote and things like that then yeah but you know i think different kinds of votes need different kind of uh, privacy but i do think ballot progress is a really important one which is a huge problem with you know people using snapshot or stuff like that where you can see how the vote is progressing yeah you know, interesting factoid, in, in ancient Rome, different communities would vote one after another. And the communities that got to go, go first were in a special privileged position for exactly that reason, Ruben, because they, they could set the tone for who was, who was going to be elected. So if you think about it, being able to vote first, it has, has some extra power associated with it if the, if the uh, voting process is being tracked. Yep, definitely. When when we designed Aura, I mean, it wasn't entirely designed for like just DAO voting. It was meant to be used like for government elections, like the way that we we carried out elections in Thailand. So like in those cases, yeah, for sure, full voter privacy, ballot progress completely, uh, you know, being hidden because you know when you're dealing with with citizens, uh, it's a bit different, right? But but yeah. Also, what it means to be identified ha has some some shades of gray to it. I mean, you could be identified. You don't necessarily need to be identified as a person. You could be identified as an identity that you've assumed, right? And that identity could just could be decoupled from the from the person. Like the, I mean, like you know, people always talk about like Singapore as a great example. Like even in Malaysia, you know, like areas that vote against like you know a certain way get cut off from from a lot of services so like there is oh really you know even you know you say yeah they do like like if you take a look in singapore they, they say like yeah they it is uh free but not necessarily fair you know there's a lot of gerrymandering there's a lot of like things to to the kind of uh you know mess up a certain thing so so in those cases it's like mm, you know like I guess it's a bit hard because how do you then say that, oh, you know, we're not going to consider votes. You need to have like certain regional data if you're fighting for certain area. But, you know, I think gerrymandering is like a separate problem that, you know, I would say on-chain voting doesn't uh, do anything about because, uh, yeah, because 
Yeah, I mean, like in US, you know, gerrymandering is a problem. I think in any country, gerrymandering is a problem. And, and for those of you who don't know what gerrymandering is, is that basically you are drawing the boundaries of like what a district looks like. Like, okay, this is a Republican district, this is a Democrat district, and I draw the lines to, to fit me so that as a result, only a few of the states are actually like swing states, right? And and those are the only ones that I have to, to focus on. And that's an ongoing problem, and especially for people who are entrenched in power. They will draw the lines to be, favor them and like, oh, you know, it's a very strong Republican president. If I'm a Democrat, I'm just going to cut out half of them and put them in a in a Democrat com uh, community so they get kind of like silence and stuff like that. So... Um, yeah, I mean, probably not not relevant to the uh, voting and governance in in crypto communities, but uh, it's just an interesting thought as well. I I think one other important factor in in like voting in cryptocurrencies, and it it goes back to what you said earlier about you, you know some people voting to favor themselves over others. And it's different from say corporate situations is with corporations you know at least in the u.s the corporations they each state has its own system and some states like delaware are famous for having really good law that does things exactly like that it protects like minority shareholders from from um from you, you know the big owners and uh so there's like this fallback system that's outside of the corporation where people can go for redress and we don't tend to have that in cryptocurrency right we don't i mean we can't reasonably expect to say okay you know our our privacy coin we're good what, what jurisdiction are we going to go to how are we going to resolve it there's there's not that fallback and so we we need to build more like protective systems right into the model, and um, and I think I, that's um, that's what's happening. Like we're, we you know we're talking about all these different kinds of voting mechanisms, you know, decred and and look just like the variety we have in this discussion today. And I think it's very formative what we're doing. I mean, what we're doing is like searching out the optimal solution, something that was done. You know, I haven't really studied the history of corp how corporations came into being, but it didn't just magically appear one day. It came in over, over time as people tried different things and it's even still evolving, right? In the U.S., we had this, this LLC concept. It's like a next generation corporation that has more flexibility. So I think we need to, we need to try. It's great you know, all of us were trying different things and we feel out how we're going forward and find the best solutions and it will continue to evolve over time. Sure, but these problems are also like not new. I mean, governance has been an issue, not just for, vo not just for crypto projects, but for civilization in general, for, 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 sure, like, for you know, tribes. As, long as, yeah. Yeah, as long as civilization has, has existed, right? And, but but and, even even out in that outside world, we're still experimenting, right, Ruben? I mean, we've got like LLCs, new things. So it's it's um, it's still an experiment in the outside world, and cryptocurrency does bring new things in, like anonymity, you know, online cross jurisdictional things that that do merit more. You know, they merit experimentation. I think. You're 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 absolutely right. We have a lot to draw from, don't we? And we should we should study what has been done and incorporate it. But there there's still some new pieces in there, new enough that let us experiment, like with quadratic voting. That's a that's a fairly new thing, right? I mean, when was when was quadratic yeah, voting past, becoming popular? Past fairly years. recent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the things that like, is also interesting to discuss is that there are a lot of voting systems where there's a lot of checks and balances. And I forgot the exact name, but it was this like Indian tribes. There are like five Indian tribes and like somehow it's a very collaborative process which 
you know, focuses more on like achieving consensus, right? And it was something that I did think about, oh, maybe this is the way we should, uh, you know, approach governance at Firo, where, you know, you have different parties, you have the miners, you have the master nodes, you have the code contributors and all of them. All of them have a, a say in their own right. And I, I, I kind of forgot the exact details, but I remember I was thinking like, this is really great. But it's really slow and it's just so hard to, execute right and and one of the big issues is that the the more the better the generally the better the voting system is it also becomes more complicated for the average joe to understand which kind of defeats the point of the it's whole true. thing to, to begin yeah. with <laughs> that's pretty neat though that you're thinking along those lines so would this system like give like say code contributors an explicit vote i mean would it be like like uh, how 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 would that work? I, I think that's an interesting line of thought. Well, then you have like people like the stock, uh, you know, the stock airdrop, where you know everyone was just doing like uh, corrections to to um, to to the spelling and like getting huge airdrops of of stock tokens. <laughs> hmm. So yeah, I mean, like obviously, you know, I'm just very curious, like you know, for like where in in terms of like you know on chain governance. I mean, I I I would hesitate to say that maybe coin voting is feasible, but only if you have an emission that is kind of like um, kind of like grins, where where you have a fixed emission like for eternity, right? In no, the sense that. High. Uh huh. Yeah. That, well, I mean, it's high, but then over time, it becomes like a tail emission. It is that's in true. fact a tail that's emission. That's true. Over time, yeah. it shrinks. It's a percentage, yeah. doesn't it? Correct. But I feel like in that Monero case, Monero works a, that way too. Yeah, it's a little bit fairer because then there is well, Monero had like you know a, a big part of the supply was emitted, and then you had a the little bit. While with um, with green, it's just like a fixed emission all the way. I mean, bad for price, but. If you talk about fairness, if you talk about coin voting, that means like, you know, if you do nothing and if you don't like continue to mine or acquire more, your vote is continuously being diluted, which is kind of fair-ish, right? You know, uh, so in that case where there is no reward for being early, then that may be, uh, you know, it's a, I guess a balance between, uh, you know, rewarding people who hold the coin and rewarding, uh, allowing newcomers to come in as well, because, mm -hmm. you know, you have that constant emission at the end. So, so that's something interesting. Um, you know, I haven't seen it really play out, but it's kind of unfortunate that I think one of the things that I also want to really bring up on is that a lot of times on-chain governance usually devolves into governance theater where people say oh look we have decentralized governance look you know we are managed by a freaking DAO when actually it's like you know a bunch of five six people that are basically calling the shots right <laughs> and we've seen right. this in many many communities like even Komodo's notary voting system I seem like I, I I I I can't even you know begin to think like okay one on-chain voting system where uh, maybe Decred, I don't really know so much about how distributed the thing is, and I do feel like they have benevolent uh, people who are voting, right? But a lot of the times, it just feels like, oh, you know, it's just a very select group of people that are calling the shots. And because of the appearance of a DAO, it kind of like washes away all of this, like, ah, oh, it's on-chain governance, it's fine, you know, code is law, which is, come on, total bullshit. I really hate the code is law thing because it's like, who set the code, right? It's humans, we set the rules. The, the code is executing the rules. So, <laughs> like, come on. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, speaking oh, of that, yeah. I think a very unique thing that uh, layer one at these blockchains have in terms of governance uh, that is very difficult to replicate in the real world is forks. So, for example, when people don't agree with some decisions, and so there is some sometimes a contentious fork. And now you have two blockchains and then people flock to the blockchain that they prefer. Uh, and this is also sort of a voting process in a way, right? Right, right, absolutely. Uh, yeah, you, you can't do technically country, a fault. unfortunately, but uh, the blockchain can do that. 
I think that's a good point, and that is often cited as like, oh yeah, this is the way that governance will work. Because if you don't like what we do, you can always fall off the project. But obviously, the longer the project exists, the harder that happens. Like, I mean, take a look at what Bitcoin, you know, it's like this select group of people just decided, ah, yes, you know, the Bitcoin block size isn't going to, to increase, even though the miners were against it, you know, there were lots of people. Like, I feel like that was like, it becomes very hard because you have, once once a certain thing is entrenched, you know, how are you going to justify the exchange? Oh, which, you know, when you have a centralized exchange, oh, which one's the real one, right? <laughs> and usually they're going to, 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 to favor the incumbent, right? And the longer something has uh, has existed, the harder it is to, to fork out something. And the interesting thing is actually Firo or Zcoin as it then was, is technically a fork because we forked out our scammy co-founder <laughs> who, who, who wanted to, to take all the money for himself. And, and that was done with community support, but that was like in month two or three of the, of the project's life. So it was relatively easy to switch. You know, we managed to convince the exchanges, the mining boosts, the support, support us but if you had you know if it was like in a very large project and like you know we wanted to do a fork like that it was going it's going to be a lot harder and in that case it was also kind of clear that the the co-founder was 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 a bit of an ass uh <laughs> but hmm. yeah but and more I, like I, yeah in, go on in, in in other kind of uh, uh side of that coin the larger the project the more interest there is in that project, the more money involved and the more power involved. So for example, I'm very interested to see what will happen with Bitcoin uh, once somebody decides that maybe this uh, 21 million emissions should be changed uh, and then like huge amounts of Bitcoin will be by then controlled by large companies that we see happening today. And I think that would be, that would be interesting to watch. Right, that, that day is coming, isn't it? Somebody's going to try that. I'm certain at some yeah. point they will decide that uh, there is not enough Bitcoin for everyone and try to rectify it through some kind of a fork of this kind. Yeah, it, that, that would be the big test, I think, to, to see how it really works. They kind of like backed themselves into a corner to keep on like repeating the mantra, oh, 21 million. But hey, you know, they managed to say Bitcoin is not supposed to be used like cash. It's supposed to be a store value and laser eyes and ETF. So who knows? Maybe they can actually convince people to do that, right? I mean, it's just such a joke to me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, may maybe the right way to look at forking is like it's the it's like the ultimate fallback. I mean, you're totally right, Ruben. I mean, it, from a practical perspective, it becomes really hard. But if something, it, it depends on how bad things go. Things go really badly. It's it's always an option. It's kind of like you know, going back, we were talking about all these problems humans have faced for all time. It's like the tribe, right? I mean, if things go bad enough with the tribe, you fork off and form your own new tribe. And uh, it's um, it's just one more piece of, of all these many pieces that contribute to governance. It's like the ultimate fallback in a world where you don't have a legal jurisdiction to go to and resolve it. And another thing that actually happened, I mean, we're running up, uh, we're kind of like at the one hour mark, but I just wanted to, to bring this up because it was pretty interesting. And I don't know if you guys remember this project called Steemit. And Steemit also had yeah. some sort of like governance or like voting with coins. I don't know the exact, uh, remind, um, you know, I don't resent the exact mechanism, but I remember one thing was I think Justin Sun was, you know, trying to, I think, like, you know, had like some sort of takeover or steam it. And he managed to convince the exchanges who were holding tons of the, the steam it tokens that were custodied on behalf of customers to vote his way. And, you know, that kind of like, you know, you say coin voting is, is, is the way to go. What are you going to do about exchanges, right? If they vote a certain way, are you going to honor it? Or you say, ah, no, no, exchange, uh, exchange ones, we cannot count it. But if the exchange really wants to hide, they can hide it, right? So how, how do you tell that apart if exchanges choose to exercise the voting power of the people who custody their funds with them? And that's a that, that I think that it's hard to solve if you're just doing 
on-chain vote thing. Well, that's a good point. Yep. People who are custodying, have their funds custodied with someone else, that other person can vote them. Absolutely. I, you know, I guess the question would be how big of a problem that, that would be. It certainly, it certainly is, is potentially a problem. Or a broke stimulant, for sure. <laughs> yeah, right. So well, anyway, I think, we are see, I, I think the... Dr. Cap is uh, is having connection issues. You're right, Ruben. We're coming up. Uh, should we see? Does, are there any questions? Should yeah, yeah. That's what I was hoping. Let's see. Um, I guess people can put, put put up their hands if they want to ask a question oh, or right in Dr. the thread. Dr. Cap is saying we can maybe add him as back as a speaker. Oh, okay. He's added back. Yeah, um, Cap has been getting some connection issues. I've been able to uh, hear you, but I'm back in now. Yay. Oh, good. It's, um, I, ju I just want to say, yeah, no, we're getting in on one hour. I have so much I could say on this, but I feel like the there's a couple of things I kind of want to, I want to kind of summarize it almost into a framework based on what you guys have been saying. Um, I'm going to basically give my own piece here. I agree. I don't think, I think there's a lot of flaws with coin voting particularly in proof of stake systems potentially, or well, there's a lot of ways to play that system, but I'll basically get to what I'm getting at. Um, you know, touching on the whole Justin Sun steam it, um, you know, do we really need coin voting? Do, would it be better to have a system of node voting? So one node, one vote, as opposed to you own, you know, 20% of the supply, therefore you have 20% of the vote. Because well, you can stipulate it still, and, with, and then you start. Oh, let's have a coin holding, then it becomes master note holding. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I think my, my, my whole thinking is if you had one node, one vote, then it kind of detaches that whole you know, that there's a recognition there that just because you hold the majority of the wealth doesn't necessarily mean you have the best interest of the system at heart. And then the interests of the system may be short term, but they more, may also be long term. And, you know, you're right. It is very much dependent on the intention, personality, mindset of of the whales, if you're using a coin holding system. So there's that human factor element. And then it's, it's the aspects of privacy. You know, in my ideal world, you know, you'd have a transparent forum in the sense that you don't necessarily want to know who is voting for what. In my, in my mind, but you definitely want to be able to see and view all of the different arguments for and against a proposal, and you definitely want to be able to kind of look and drill down, you know, just and be able to write, you know, arguments for and against. And in my ideal world, you know, it's interesting because you say that there's a somewhat slight difference between citizens voting and and voting on on a technical project. And I think I think. You know, with, without getting too lost into this, because um, there's so many avenues you can get go down. But going back to the idea of a framework, in my ideal world, you know, the participants of a vote would be obfuscated in some way. So you don't necessarily know who's voting and you don't necessarily know in what direction. And then again, going back to that whole, well, what way is a vote going is a way to hide the outcome of a vote till the very end so that people don't get demoralized or influenced. And I feel like there's aspects there from a privacy point of view that really need to be considered. I do think any kind of legitimate... Let's see, it, it broke up a little bit for me, Dr. Cap. Yeah. Say that again. Let me see what he said. Question again. Hmm. Oh, gosh, it's it's <laughs> not it's robot. not really coming through, Doctor Cap. I don't know if you can hear us. A... Yeah, it's not coming through. <laughs> it's not coming through. So maybe. By the way, what what Doctor Cap is saying, Aura <laughs> does all of that. So. I mean, like, it, it's still like, you know, we don't have any of the cryptographic library, but, um, you know, we have the whole scheme drawn out in the paper 
uh, we're actually trying to see if any governments would be interested in implementing it as a polling system to begin with. You know, we're trying to see like, hey, you know, if you can poll your population for opinions uh, without fear of re repercussions, that will be a good first step because like the threat level is a lot lower when it's just polling versus something like, you know, elections. Uh, so yeah, I'm really interested to see how that goes. Uh, obviously, you know, although it was like developed by the Firo team, I don't think it's right for for us to spend like fewer resources on like a, a side election uh, type of thing, but kind of came from our work with uh, Lelantis and stuff like that. But I'm talking too much and uh, I guess we should make sure to open the, the floor if anyone wants to ask questions or have something to chime in. Let's see, do you see any questions? Let's see. See, it looks like Captain Lutz from Pirate Chain. Uh, let's see what is it. Now, well, Captain Lutz from Pirate Chain is making an issue about privacy by default, and and um, you know certainly, right? That's a there's good good aspects both ways, I would say. And many people think privacy by default is the way to go. That's the way it is, I know, with um, with Pirate Chain, like with Monero. And it's good that those exist. Uh, Could be a good topic for the next uh, space. Yeah, yeah. Good to a very good topic for the next space. So thank you, Captain Lutz from Pirate Chain. Pirate Chain's a good, um, is certainly a, a, a member in our privacy coin community. Okay, well, should we, um, I think Dr. Cap, there's this communication problem. Should we, uh, should we? Uh... Yes, we've uh, unfortunately lost Dr. Cap for most of this space, unfortunately. Um, I suppose I do have a quick question for you guys, um, which I, I love the, um, the point Ruben made about um, sort of the the ability of certain chains to to if if the 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 supply is not distributed well enough, it can become like a, um, a, a very political issue when on chain voting is is a thing. Um, and I, I suppose uh, Ruben, you would you would still like the idea of uh, decentralized governance in a in a in an ideal scenario is that fair to say yeah yes that that is correct i mean uh i do think that coin voting shouldn't coin holding should maybe be one of the 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 like you know things that entitle you to vote but it should not be the sole determinant and it should be a cap on how much weight it happens but the problem is then how do you prevent like the sock puppets which is why you need the additional forms of verification but still remain privacy preserving right because we don't want people to be doing kyc or, or stuff like that and i guess you know github activity or forum age is first obviously not perfect but um they are i guess it's better than nothing especially when you have multiple ways to verify a person's involvement in the community i think that is obviously no system is perfect but it's a lot harder to game if you have to game both the coin holdings, you have, you have to have the coin holdings, you have to have the activity, you have to have the forum age and all of that and show the, the reasonings of your voting. I think that would be my ideal system. And I have some ideas on how I would implement that. Uh, it's just like, yeah, don't have the current resources, but it is something we are heading towards too. Yeah. I, I very much liked what Alex from Beam Privacy said about um, forking sort of being really the and I guess the bedrock of, of decentralized governance in crypto. We do have offer an XMR um, that had a question, I believe. Yeah. Is that yeah. No, I was just going to agree with what Ruben just said, but go back to the the node voting and bring up how Bitcoin and Monero have like more than two thousand fake nodes that that are sibling the nodes on a regular basis. And if you were just simply not doing hard enough checks on them, you would think that they're real voters or that they're real nodes. Right, but they say they send fake data and they, they just track users. So, you know, like you can't just but but at the same time, that's one of those things where in the narrow you'll have people that show up 
and they don't own Monero. They don't run nodes. They don't have anything to do with the project. They just want to come and, and make noise, right? So that's where it's like, you know, there should be little lit, like if you're doing voting like that, there should be little litmus tests, right? Like if you, if you, if you don't have anything to do with the project, if you're not a developer, you don't contribute in any way, you don't run a node, you don't own any Monero, then why are you here, right? But you have a lot of these people, like like where he was saying about like exchanges. Exchanges might hold thirty percent of the entire of the entire coin, and they'll vote it to do whatever makes their pockets fatter. So, but at the same time, they probably uh, only one one or two nodes. If uh, can you guys hear me by any chance? Yes. Yes, we can. I can hear you now. I just feel kind of following from what FXML has been saying. I think there's something to be said about making sure that you have a really strong distribution system. You want to make sure that there, before you kind of engage in a governance system, I almost feel that you need to have as maximized social distribution as possible. I don't. I think coin voting, when you have heavy centralization of coins, well. If, if the people to whom that's centralized to are making smart, sensible decisions and the ecosystem grows, that's great. But if they're acting in their short-term interests, then eventually that entire system will fall apart. And there is a tendency for people to, you know, everyone acts in their own self-interest. It's just what those self-interests are. And I feel that, you know, what those interests are, it's very much dictated somewhat by the, your personality, your neuropsychology, the way you view the world. Um, but kind of going back to that key thing, you know, you know, we shouldn't be having 30% of coins on a centralized exchange. Right. We shouldn't be in a position where Justin Sun can, you know, admittedly that was like eight years ago with Steemit, but that's still very much a thing that can happen now. We should be in a position where these coins should be on decentralized exchanges if, if you're going to utilize coin voting, you know. The, the the supply needs to be distributed in order to have a robust governance system. Decision making needs to be distributed if you need to have a robust uh, governance system. And in order to have distributed decision making, you need our active participants. And in order to have active participants, they need to be engaged. And in order to be engaged, they need to be incentivized i.e. the system that you're providing for them is genuinely useful in some way. Now, my big criticism of most cryptocurrency is that it's primarily a tool for speculation. So, and my big criticism of the last bull market is you had DAOs popping up left, right, and center with governance tokens that people would just speculate on. And it was just a glorified form of casinoing as far as I was concerned, because most of these DAOs, they would raise a ton of funds but then they would go nowhere and because their governance was inherently badly designed and because the intent of their communities was speculative return rather than actually being engaged because they are getting something that is useful in an organic sense, you know, that goes beyond speculation, you know, something that creates value in, in a very meaningful and lasting way. You know, because you had all of those sorts of participants, a lot of those DAOs subsequently collapsed. So I think when you, when you approach governance, a lot of what you guys have said today is very much about behavioral factors on an individual and on a group level and incentivization on an individual and in a group level. And, you know, I feel definitely the next topic I would love to do, which is should we have privacy by default for a governance system? I think that could be an entire topic in its own right. I'd love to have pirate chains guy come on as a guest and i noticed that we've had exitors from decred on uh, as well you know if, if you've got anything to say feel free to like chime in here but um i really do think distribution and social consensus is a really powerful thing that needs to be factored in here uh, one of the things that i just thought about like well i, I actually basically thought about this back in the in the steam days was like if coin voting was going to be one of the things and how do we prevent exchanges from actually exercising that vote willy-nilly and making sure that the people who are voting with the coins are in it for the long term right and one way is to actually i think in a similar like a decred system you don't get the right to vote straight away uh, and 
one way it's like to say, well, okay, now I'm going to, if you want to get those tickets, you want to get those voting rights, you have to lock your funds for X period of time, which allows you to earn like voting tickets over time. And, you know, uh, if you want to unlock them, there is like kind of like a cool down period. So it makes it very hard for the exchanges to do that because then they may have a bank run because the, the, the funds are being locked or something. Obviously, it doesn't completely mitigate it, especially if it's a fractional reserve. But it's an interesting idea where you can like say, well, you know, if you really believe in the coin, you're going to be willing to hold it for like an X amount of time. But it's just a master note system where you can, you know, get in, get out, uh, almost like you know, just in 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 quite a fast time. Uh, so so yeah, that that is uh, interesting uh, way to approach it. But you know, of course, only addresses one one part of the problem. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Like Cosmos has, it's like three weeks. There's a lockup period to to vote with Adam. So it's a that's that that's a very good idea, Ruben as a way to address exchange voting. One of the things with Monero, one of the reasons I feel like Monero is strong is because it doesn't Even? rely on any of any of the Guys? people. Yep, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Monero, okay. Monero doesn't uh, rely. It, it, yeah, it doesn't rely on any of the participants, any of the contributors having having. Oh, I can pockets. hear Yen, but is anyone else speaking? I know, oh, just me. Dr. Kep, yes, there is a speaker. I don't think you can hear him, but he's... He, he's oh, can hear off. Gonna, sorry, I'm going to leave and come back. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't rely on anybody in the community to have fat pockets or anything like that, right? Like, you could just be somebody that learns about Monero and knows what Monero is and needs Monero for your day-to-day -day life or for your country or for your town, whatever. It, you might not have money, right? Like, you might not be able to, to join in an official voting process. But there's nothing in Monero that stops you from coming and voting just like everybody else. And it's, it goes back to, to what, what we were talking about with, um, like rep, not reputation, but with people knowing who you are. It's not, of course, you can't just show up out of nowhere and just be a random person and say, hey, you know, I wanna, I wanna change this, this and that. But there's a lot of people that hang out in the community, have been there for years and have been contributing, whether it's their peace of mind or small pieces of code here and there or, or just trying to onboard people, right? And these people, all, all their votes should be weighed and respected and I feel should be weighed even more than somebody who just makes money off of Monero. Right, Monero has- I agree community. and I think- Now, now it does- I, I think one- Go of, ahead, Ruben. Yeah, Ruben. sorry. I think one of the things that really make uh, Monero, and I, I'm not saying that Monero's governance is perfect. You know, some would argue that, ah, oh, yeah, it's being captured by, you know, very uh, weird people and whatnot. You know, they, I mean, I heard mutterings of that. But the main thing is that why Monero's governance also kind of works is that because there's a very strong aligned values. Everyone know what's what Monero's values are, right? So there's already like a, almost like an informal constitution in place. So that there's already a general direction. And that if you want to have your voice heard and there's already a strong community enforcing that kind of like manifesto, then like, you know, you have to align with those values as well, right? So that kind of acts like a informal kind of like litmus test, right? Uh, so, so I think that's cool, you know, and be, it, this type of governance only kind of works if you have a strong already core group of community that are aligned and that are, you know, I would say like semi-benevolent, right? They, 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 they are not going to like, you know, shut down people and there's very really, uh, like key, you know, anti-censorship and all this type of values which keeps that kind of working. Uh, but yeah, it can be subverted, but, you know, I there's also Earth's governance is working and yeah right e even though you can show up and it's a very good point with monero you can show up and you can have a voice but ultimately the funding for for monero comes from donations right and like there's a, that the 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 mechanism often works there's many small donations and then a whale comes through and like tops it all off right or tops off the ones they want to fund and so there there's still there's still an aspect of that of the of the big coin holders, the whales, having influence through donations. But that goes back to Monero having its principle. There's lots of whales out there 
whether it's governments or whether it's Binance themselves that want Monero to win, but can't say so. And because they can vote privately, they'll donate the Monero without, without thinking twice. Oh, right, right. I think it's, I think it's good. I'm just, but, but it is an element. All I'm pointing out in, in, in absolutely. I mean, there's, there's, it's, it's good and it's working, but there is more to it than just like, just like the votes, right? There's an element of it of, of holders having an influence too. Well, in Monero, a lot of times we'll do the work before the money comes. So it's not really, you know, the money is like nice and, but when CCS has failed, We've got the general fund to back it up, and the general fund is mo is mostly funded by by small donations that that trickle in on, on a regular basis. You can see the fund watch account on Twitter. You can see like two dollars coming in all the time. Well, wasn't there I, some objection to retroactive funding? That was because I was banned, and bad oh, actors okay. that yeah, bad actors that that stole twenty five thousand dollars from CCS wanted to stop full chain membership groups. So, you know, stuff happens. But I came back and we made sure we got that merge. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Okay, I, I, I have to go soon. It's like 11.20 PM. I mean, uh, I think we're kind of running off time, but yeah. Yeah. you guys want to continue? Go ahead, yeah. Oh, I think I think we're at a good good stopping point. Why don't we? Uh... Yes, I don't believe we have any more questions. Um, thank you so much, guys. That was a very interesting, very, we could have three of those, I believe. Good. Thank you so much to Alex from Beam for being with us today. And uh, unfortunately, we lost Gaff for much of, much of it, but and very good points by our friend Offernex tomorrow as well. Yes. No, the, the, the good thing thank is, you guys very much. I just want to thank you guys. I could hear you, most of you throughout. For some reason, it was cutting me out of speaker, but uh, I'd definitely love to continue this conversation at a later date. And I think, as, as mentioned, kind of this discussion of privacy by default, I, I think as the, as the standard of governance, certainly that's a topic I'd like to explore further if you guys are cool with it. Sounds yeah, good. sounds good. Very good. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you, Alex, for joining us today. Hey, thank you.